Greetings, everyone. Thank you for joining me on this short analysis uh, regarding the <clears throat> reemergence of the case of Casey Anthony, of which she was accused of uh, killing her own daughter, Kaylee, years ago. I'd like to talk about a few things uh, in terms of the analysis and what that has shown and uh, some of the thoughts that uh, I have that are more opinions than anything else, but some of the uh, things about the case are quite interesting. If you're not familiar with the case, uh, the toddler went missing years ago, and uh, Casey was known as a promiscuous party girl who went a month without reporting her missing. So she was missing for a month. Um, there's some things about the case that are well known to everyone. It caught the attention of the uh, media, uh, especially with her personality and uh, what she was doing. And um, the media became a large player in this. And that brings out attorneys who are looking to uh, score some free publicity. And so you had Jose Baez there and uh, she was convicted of lying, but eventually she was uh, acquitted of the murder. It wasn't proven. It was a, uh, I think for most of us, a very shocking uh, jury result. And some of the subsequent uh, jury members that went public added to that. And um, it seemed like a very easy case to solve and that sort of thing. So it was frustrating on a lot of levels. And there were people that were emotionally involved uh, just for the cause of justice that ran on that. But Casey was an unusual case, I think, in terms of the personality traits uh, and what she has done in the case and, and since that time. And she is now, uh, more than a decade later, speaking out again for a documentary and so we're going to have some insight, I think, into her personality. It's difficult to get past the behavioral analysis. It, it is something that is stark. And we've seen it on other cases, lots of other cases. A baby goes missing and uh, the parent shows little interest in finding the baby. And that is the, red, the major red flag that something terrible has happened. And um, we'll get past tense references where there should not be. We look at it all in context, but guilty people speak a certain way. Casey's a little bit different in this sense. And, and this is why it, I think it's important for our understanding. Casey is one of the rare fabricators of reality. And this is not something um, controversial either. And, and I think she admits it in the documentary, at least the snippets I have from it. The rare fabricator of reality is not a panic lie, which everyone tells. And then, then we look for a conscience later on, you know, I shouldn't have said that and that sort of thing. Or even a, a, a massive self-preservation lie that later breaks down. With Casey, it was an entire fabrication of life. The fabricate, we call it the fabrication of reality. It's very rare, uh, perhaps 10% 10, 10 or less of those who lie do so in this way, uh, mostly with men more than women. And although she's been called a sociopath, and I have a strong opinion about that, I'm going to use the phrase sociopathic life, uh, like sociopathic like, or this is similar to someone who's a sociopath and someone who uh, doesn't show an apparent emergence of a conscience. The sociopath does lie with fabrication of reality, the, the invention. Most lies come from withheld information. So there's a lot of points of truth and then there's something missing. And that's what we pick up on and we look for. When someone, uh, is able to fabricate reality, uh, they pose a danger to society. And in the rear view mirror, obviously Casey did, and still does, it, it, as you'll see from the quotes. 
But it's going to be interesting to compare her original statement with the statement she made, uh, at least reported to have made in the documentary. We'll be able to look at those statements and compare them a little bit. Now, I generally use a warning where I say, and this is from an article, and it's heavily edited, so I, I want to be careful. Not so much with Casey Anthony, because I've seen so much over the years from her and, and from her parents, and uh, hopefully I can answer some of the questions there. But her, her most recent statements are going to see that she claims to have And that her father did something to Kaylee, and to this day she still doesn't know. And we'll find that credible or not. It is an interesting uh, and compare the two uh, statements more than a decade apart, and to see if there's any similarities in the in the patterns of the language. I'd like to be able to take some questions as well. But what I want to do is is look at originally. The first contact was a 911 call, but it wasn't made by Casey. It was made by her mother. And her mother was in a panic and her mother was in, in earnest. And this was part of behavioral analysis. The mother eventually put Casey on the phone. And one of the first things that Casey said was, I'm sorry. And we, we flagged that for the possibility of it entering a language with regret rather than politeness. We always look at context. Some of the things that were concerning to me early on was uh, Casey had some, what we would look at as being cute names for Kaylee. And I, I think some people took exception to that back then because I, I said it's a red flag. Uh, we all have those type of funny names and um, but the context was the baby was missing, the toddler was missing. And that's different. That's a, an entirely different context. And at, at times it can be a shifting of blame over, which is very concerning that, that somehow or another a justification, uh, she was a snot nosed kid, therefore she deserved that. So, the behavioral analysis that she, she did not report the child missing for uh, a month, that her mother had to do it, that she had to get on the phone reluctantly. And then she did make a statement to police, which is very helpful. Later on, I think people saw that the parents were lying for her, particularly the mother. Uh, you'll recall that Tim Miller and Texas Equisearch went from Texas to Florida in no small expense to search for the child. And uh, the mother would not allow him to speak to Casey. Even though Casey, who had been arrested at one point, had said in, to the camera that she believed in her heart that Kaylee was close, and indeed she was. But uh, eventually, and, and this may be over the course of an hour or so, it was a very short period of time, Cindy Anthony, who, who took the lead, kicked Tim Miller out and would not even allow Casey to point on the map where they should start searching. And so he left. George and Cindy went out to the media and Cindy said, George and I don't believe Kaylee's in the woods or anything. And as far as I could tell, no media said, hey, do you think she's in the woods? And that type of statement in the negative is very important. And as you know, she was found in the woods uh, less than a half mile from the house. So um, Casey saying in her heart she knew she was close. Some of those verbal slips that come out, um, we, we have a tendency to think of the fabricators of reality as being uh, extraordinarily clever. And that's not always true. They sometimes lose track of their statement because it doesn't come from experiential memory. Experiential memory is um, far less taxing because we have emotions associated with the actions. We remember it that way. We remember it in chronological order. So it was, it's a different type of liar that we're looking at. Uh, the cover-up went in very heavily, especially on 
on Cindy's part, perhaps a, a great deal of guilt on her part. Um, we even saw where Jose Baez was accused of having sexual relations with Casey. His denial was uh, very unreliable. In fact, it was so unreliable that I was able to conclude deception indicated on that. And what he did was, you know, like a lawyer parsing his words, that he didn't have sex with Casey in exchange for lawyer fees. So he, he qualified it that way. And um, his follow-up statement was worse than his original live statement on television. Uh, so we saw that type of, of cloud. And um, I think that Casey was, I don't know where she is now, because they, they, there's perhaps a, a, a loss of power and authority over others, but uh, including sexually. But she was a manipulator, a manipulator. And the ability to fabricate that she had a nanny and a job and all these things, uh, you're going to see she's going to address that in the uh, short statements we have from the article. So it should be quite interesting. Let's take a look first at um, her statement that she gave to police. And this one's been analyzed, and I have it at the Statement Analysis blog, and, and some of you are probably very familiar with it. It is great for learning. And what's really fascinating, and, and some struggle with this a little bit, uh, and training will get them over the, the hurdle, is that with a statement like this, let's see if I can get the statement up by itself. With a statement like this, we see someone begins a statement with the pronoun I, meaning their psychological presence. The psychological presence is very strong. Generally speaking, we're going to have a good deal of reliable information to glean from it. Even if the person is deceptive, generally speaking, when a statement starts with the pronoun I, we will not only get reliable information, but if the person is deceptive, it is most always likely to be due to missing information. So in other words, what I'm asserting is really helpful, really true. You can see it. What I'm withholding from you is what I need to withhold from you. That is the general pattern. When you have someone who begins a statement and can use strong pronoun presence, strong psychological presence, reliability, believing their own words type thing, in that sense, and they are fabricating, you are looking at that rare and dangerous to society liar. Now we talk about sometimes manipulators losing strength over years, and, and this has to do with mostly with males in the declination of the, or the declining of testosterone, for example. And they lose strength, so they're not as violent or as dangerous in that sense. Some still are, and, and uh, some molesters, for example, will, will molest even long after they're, they've reached a, an age where they, you would think they would not be able to do such a thing. But they still do and still harm. It just doesn't have the physical uh, impact always in terms of the violent element to it. They, they kind of age out. And with Casey, she got by on her looks and her manipulation. And uh, I think perhaps that she's got a, a payday in, in mind with this most recent documentary. So she begins with the pronoun I, she's here for us. Casey is here for us to see her. This is her presence. Like it or not, Believe her or not, she's here. And so when someone uh, allows their presence to be known, we need to take strong notice because she's giving us personality traits. She's giving us a little bit of insight into perhaps her own childhood, that sort of thing. So I'll just do a brief analysis here and, and maybe take some questions on it. I got off work, left Universal driving back to pick up Kaylee, like a normal day. So I've highlighted the pronoun I, which then goes missing here, which is an interesting point. We highlight where a pronoun goes missing as well. 
And this is the departure of a place. So instead of going to pick up Kaylee, in her mind, she is leaving a place. So instead of moving forward, looking ahead, I went to the store. I left my home to go to the store. I didn't say I went to the store, but that's um, my brain is not moving forward. My brain is at home. I, I can't get to the store unless I leave home. It's unnecessary to stay. She's bringing it up. I got off work, left Universal. Now she has a little bit of, a, of an issue with this. Uh, and we know she wasn't working there at this time. Driving back. And this is the reason why I was driving back. And you might ask, driving back where? You didn't mention a place earlier. So you, you see me highlighting this. What I'm doing is calling the eye's attention to the high level of sensitivity. She's present. She's here. She's telling us. And she's lying. And here we have the word normal, which we highlight. And I'll do that in red. When someone has a need to portray something as normal, they're telling us it was anything but. And there is nothing normal about a kidnapping. And so if, if you, this is all you had, you would be able to conclude she is deliberately withholding information about what happened to her daughter. For whatever reason, she's deliberately withholding it. And the strange thing is, is her psychological presence is strong, except leaving Universal. She didn't tell us that she left Universal. She tells us the reason why she's driving back, back to work, because that's the only place she's mentioned here. And this is what happens where, uh, this is why I say the fabricators of reality are very dangerous, uh, rare. They can be conf confrontational uh, in terms of their statements, but it's not coming from experiential memory. So it gets mixed up like a game of telephone. It can become mixed up. It can go out of order. How many of you remember this one? When she wanted to respond to uh, why the car smelled like a dead body. Dead squirrels climbed into the engine. And so you'll notice that this is somewhat humorously out of order. They would, squirrels would climb into the engine and then die there. Dead squirrels don't climb. The reason it's something this simple is out of order is because it didn't happen. She's making it up. And this is really interesting. This is reliably reported. I got off work. She doesn't say what work, but it's reliable. We have a past tense verb and the pronoun I and a very short sentence, at least to start a short sentence. This is 90% likely to be true. In her case, it's not true. The, you know, there are other signals, of course, of deception, but this is what police were dealing with. Right here. This is why when they took her back to Universal Studios and she walked up and down the hallway, she went that far. That is a unique personality. So let's say um, the police said to her, hey, you don't work at Universal. Or we're going to take you to your office at Universal. She got in the car and went all the way there with them and walked the hall. That's amazing. That is so rare. That's this. Someone can give us a reliable sentence, and in this case, at least a portion of it, the start of it, and still be lying. It, become, it can become very difficult in terms of discernment, but it is powerful. It is a powerful statement of who she is. 
Imagine the audacity, the nerve that she must have had driving in that police car to Universal Studios. And it, most people would just say, the gig is up and I'm out of here, I'm, I'm caught. No, she was gonna keep it going. Um, some of you may remember Zanny the Nanny, and it was wondered about Xanax. Did she get that name? And did she choose a Hispanic name on purpose? Uh, she gave a description of the alleged kidnapper who didn't exist, someone who didn't exist, uh, right down to the straight white teeth and the hair and makeup, everything else. Way too much detail. What that is, is a need to persuade or prove that which should need no proof. In a way, it's similar to a normal day or a normal person, someone that uh, has a need to prove that to others. It's a little bit scary, especially if you uh, investigate child abuse statements and get that. But this is past tense, and I showed up. Nope. She goes to the present tense, to the apartment, knock on door, and you see the missing article. And what this is also doing is she's slowing down the pace. She is here under stress. So therefore, since nobody answered, let me tell you the reason why I called Zenaida's cell. Watch this. This is the unnecessary leaving of and departure. This is the reason why I drove back like a normal day. Something that perhaps wouldn't have been asked. We well, certainly wouldn't have asked and please said, was this a normal day for you? And I show up, she moves to the present tense. So what was reliable which we know in hindsight was a lie, is now unreliable. And this is many years ago. So therefore, this is my reason, because what I'm thinking is that after knocking on the door, or knocking on door, and nobody answers, present tense, I better tell you why I called Zaneda. Because I know you're going to ask, well, why did you call Zaneda cell? What the person is doing and getting trapped up in their own lies is preempting the question. I can't let you ask me why I called that number. So I called, nope, she's present tense. She's back to the unreliable present tense. I call Zaneda's cell phone and it's out of service. Okay. It says the phone is no longer in service, excuse me. And you know, we're not gonna excuse you. There's no reason to give the extra detail, deadline. So because it's no longer in service, because I know you're gonna ask me what I did next and why I did that, I'll explain to you. And you see the highlighting this high sensitivity material. I sit down, there's my body posture, on the steps and wait for a little bit and I better tell you why, because you're going to say, well, why did you wait there? And that's not a question we would ask a mother of a missing child to see if maybe it was just a fluke if something happened and time passed and I didn't hear from anyone. No one showed up to the house. So, that, you know, obviously more details here. And because no one showed up at the house, and this is you know, a little upsetting for some of you that are familiar with analysis to see this much blue. Um, if you were seeing this much, and here she is back on the past tense, you're looking at hypersensitivity and you're thinking to yourself, uh, so those of you in training, that death may exist here. And it would be correct in this case. As you see this piles on. Checked a couple of other places where maybe possibly, and the, and the um, you can see the qualifying and the, the hedging there, maybe, maybe, possibly have gone. Couple stores, just regular places. 
So there you have normal again. So I'm highlighting that in the red. And then you have the word just, which is a dependent word, meaning she's uh, comparing these to something else that I know Zeta, Zenaida shops at, and she's taken Kelly before. And after, jump in time about seven, when I still hadn't heard anything, I was getting pretty upset, pretty frantic. So what we have here is the emotion that she's experiencing in the perfect part of the story. Very close contextually to when the child went missing. This is not something years later after talking to a therapist for years sort of thing. This is called artificial editing. It is a type of persuasion, uh, insight into her manipulative personality. I want you to feel sorry for me. I'm a good mother because good mothers after hours like this get upset, pretty upset, pretty frantic. And I went to a neutral place. I, I think this was probably on her mind was uh, when she went out dancing all the times and, and partying up when uh, Kaylee was allegedly missing. I didn't really want to come home. So you see, she qualifies as a lot of her language. That type of hedging is something that, that practice liars will use to be able to get out of things later on. I wasn't sure, and this is in the negative, I didn't, I wasn't, I hadn't, all the negative, all, all elevation of importance to us in, in analyzing. I didn't really want to come home. I wasn't sure what I would say about not knowing where Kaylee was. So what she's looking for to be someone that would you would feel sorry for because she doesn't know what to say. And that is maybe the most important part of this statement. It's a great statement, especially for beginning analysis and learning deception detection. But this is insightful into who she is. She is, and you've seen this in other guilty people, not only concerned with her own well-being, but her emotional well-being to the point where she is trying to make her audience feel sorry for her, that she's the victim. When you consider that she spent a month at nightclubs and partying and laughing, which um, Jose Baez called uh, ugly grieving, You're seeing someone that Kaylee experienced for those three years of her life. This is insightful or insight into a personality that is sociopathic-like. Sociopathic-like. Her feelings like her time, like everything about her, is more important than anything, including an innocent child's life. And if, if you just think in terms of creation, a three-year-old is unbearably cute. They're, the human response to a three-year-old is to protect, to hug, to jostle the hair, to just you hear grandparents talking in, in silly terms. It's because that's what they need for proper growth, for healthy growth. And we, parents and grandparents, the adults, we need to exercise that. And what parents and adults say is it comes so easy to us. There's no effort to that. And if we 
miss our children or our children's children, we get a little antsy and upset. They're just so cute, and we just love being with them. And every silly thing that comes out of their mouth, we repeat uh, as if it's an oracle from God himself. And we love it. It's very natural. And we all know of acts of, of heroic quality where a parent has laid down his or her life or gone into danger to save a child. Uh, strangers have done this. It's an instinct that we have, especially as parents. When you see the absence of that instinct, you think to yourself, is this parent guilty? Does this parent have guilty knowledge? Now, in the McCann case, one of the things that I concluded was that, you know, I couldn't draw a line to sociopathic like with the parents, even though the hatred of them is so high, because Madeline was beyond their help and they had processed that information. In this particular case, yeah, Kaylee's beyond her help. She's piling on in a manipulative way that is trying to get police to feel sorry for her. Oh, you didn't know what to say? You poor thing. So not only is it a sign of guilt, but remember, this statement began with a direct fabrication of reality. This is who she is. She is one that fabricates reality. And she did it many times over. But that's who she is. I don't argue with her. I accept her. And what happens is, and I want to answer the question about the sexual abuse. If she fabricates reality, then everything she says has to be a lie. And that's not true. That's not accurate. So she put her own emotions in the logical part of her story. And it's a story. To make it fitting. When in reality is... A mother wouldn't care at any of this point. Now, many years later, they can recall their emotions. They've talked about it a lot. Uh, some of the sting, not all of it, but some of the sting of it has been removed through re repetition. It, as if the brain becomes bored with a topic. It's, it's a survival technique. It's critically important to our survival. But, you know, I was like embarrassed about what I'm going to say about her being missing. And so there was no Zaneda. There was no babysitter. There was no um, job at that point. She wasn't an event planner. And I ended up going to my boyfriend Anthony's house, who lives in Sutton Place. And then she stopped there. So let me see if I have any questions. Uh, Outstanding questions that I can answer before I look at the statement from the um, from the article. Back. So, any questions before I move on to the next one? Yeah, and she's a pathological liar. That's what a, a fabricated reality is. It's someone who got away with it in childhood and was not corrected. So any, uh, any questions on the analysis? I, I don't know. Uh, she was always lying about who the baby's father was. And then she tried to blame others and drag them down and that sort of thing. Um, someone who was sociopathic-like doesn't care what the consequences will be on someone else. They don't care. They are in survival mode. And if someone else went to prison for what they did, all the better. Um, Z asked a great question. Is there any hope for people who fabricate reality? 
Uh, I do think so. Uh, I think it is of a religious nature and a lot of truth and accountability because that they're going to go against their own instincts. So, you know, I'm, I'm familiar with the story that the father was dead and um, I don't know. I don't know if that's true either. I, not, not that the guy didn't die, but uh, that was the father. I don't know. Uh, good question. I'd like, to, I'd like to know about the DNA test also. It would be interesting. So in the new documentary, she said that she was sexually assaulted and that this was by her father had the article, you know, the, some of the quotes out of the article. And what I had posted on Facebook was that I believe that, and I've always believed that, that um, Casey Anthony was sexually molested, sexually assaulted in childhood. And one of you mentioned it may have been, even been uh, prior to uh, speech which is a, a whole different world. You know, I wondered about the, the jury, just to answer that, how many of them did this because they were looking for a payday. You know, it was that type of hot case and uh, looking for their 15 minutes of fame and cashing in on that. Um, large difference in, in fabrication of reality and embellishment of reality. Um, one of the things I do for a living is I analyze um, employment analysis, very complicated stuff, but uh, job applications, cover letters, that sort of thing. There's a certain amount of embellishment that we have an expectation in all those things. The fabrication of reality to make the, to mark the difference would be I worked at such and such a store where I was in charge of 15 employees. The truth is that you did work in that store and that the boss had to leave for an hour. So he put you in charge of 15 employees. You made it sound like you were a supervisor on a regular basis, but really it was an hour that passed or something, something to that effect. So the embellishment, and we saw this in, in President Donald Trump, uh, almost incessantly as a negotiator. Everything was a negotiation. Everything was a negotiation. And so there's an inflation and a deflation of the language almost always. But the reality would be there. And so the person on the job interview, they did work at that place and they did, uh, they were in charge for a short time. They're playing it up and um, it, perhaps it was a good experience and uh, it's an embellishment, but it's not someone that is actually saying, I worked at such and such a store when they never did, when they never did. Um, asking the question about what indicates the possibility of sexual abuse prior to speech, uh, we look for and not just prior to speech, but prior to uh, a strong articulation, age, an ability to describe that sort of thing. We look for um, passivity in language that can mirror deception. So it's tricky. So what we want is a combination to, to explore that, a combination of reliability and passivity, passivity, in describing things. And this is why um, adult victims of early childhood sexual abuse sound like liars because it is a, a signal, or can be a signal, I don't want to be conclusive on, without a statement, that someone dissociated, that a child would dissociate just for survival's sake. And the child, um, and the one I refer to the most is a child can describe it uh, an adult uh, describing childhood abuse in passive terms, almost as if they're floating above the bed, for example, looking down, watching it take place. 
And so we always uh, remind those in sex crimes units not to dismiss these things as automatically uh, being deceptive. It's like sensitivity indicators. Sensitivity indicators do not of their own indicate deception. It, they indicate an increased emotion towards. So it, it takes more than that simplicity to, to view that. All right, so let's look at this other one now. I'll make the screen larger so you can see it. Here, there we go. So this is clipped from the article. I think I have the whole article there after the introduction. And it's really fascinating to me that she's speaking out now. I imagine it's a payday of some form. But what her speech sounds like. But, quote, it all comes back to my dad. So this, the first thing you'll notice about this, regarding her murdered child, is passivity. Passivity is used to conceal identity and or responsibility. So if I don't want to tell you that I punched somebody and I say things like punches were thrown, you'll notice that I'm removing myself from responsibility. Now that can, I just mentioned the passivity in uh, generally adult female victims of early childhood sexual abuse. That's a very specific context. We're, we're elsewhere now. The conclusion of the matter is known. Kaylee was killed. Her, she was put in a, in a burial situation that I think was very most reflective of Casey again and what uh, her personality, that sort of thing. But it's not in doubt. And according to this own sentence here, which is not even a full sentence, this is where you say she doesn't believe her own words. It all comes back. No, my dad killed her. I don't know if he drowned her, wasn't watching her, but my dad killed her. And it's interesting that, that the uh, editorial here is bluntly. This is not blunt. As a matter of fact, it wasn't not even my father, but the more personal dad of which she's taken possession of, mine. If your father killed your child, you might not call him dad, but father, or even his name. That natural recoil and wanting to separate from someone like that. Anthony accused her dad, who became the prosecution's key witness against her, of having repeatedly raped her growing up. So this is a, a, a statement that we have here. I don't know if this was a pause, the ellipsis here is a pause, or if there was more information uh, that has been edited out. But he put a pillow, and I don't get uh, too wound up about the verb here, uh, he would, that can indicate repetition. He put a pillow over my face and smother me to knock me out. Not to silence her, which was something that we'd expect, but she's giving the reason why he would put a pillow over her face and smother her to knock me out. I want to look at the screen here to, to see if any of you have any questions about that. Interesting observation, Cheryl, about the attorney. Um, interesting about maybe she grew up as a scapegoat. Um, EB, I think that's a part of it. 
Could it be that she didn't like Kaylee getting the attention from her dad? She used to get uh, jealousy. And that, that doesn't preclude uh, abuse either. And I think Casey's a little bit late to the party with the U2. I think that ship has come and gone. Um, it could be that she it was unbearable for her to see her innocent, happy young daughter. Um, I think it's a good point. Let's get back to this again. So she's explaining the reason why he would do this. And I'm already having a problem here with the passivity. I mean, now we're going into the sexual abuse itself, so I'm not going to view passivity the same way. I'm sure there were times where I was incapacitated as a child. Okay. So here she refers to herself as a child. Not as a young girl, not as a baby, not as a toddler. We will always look at the word when someone refers to themselves as a child as the possibility of abuse. Now, I want to make exceptions with that because you always have to look at context, but you might find someone who, um, a child therapist, a school teacher, pediatric nurse, there are others who will use that because um, they see children at risk regularly. So the risk, you know, we don't say kid molester. Uh, we say child molester, child molestation, child predator. That's the association with the word. Here she refers to herself as a child, which is indicative of risk and um, the possibility, and I'm using that word carefully, of abuse. Now it's likely because of other factors I'll get to. Where my body was limp and lifeless. Okay. This is distancing language where she's referring to herself as a child and separating herself from her body. I think this indicates that she verbally, that she was indeed a victim of abuse. And I'll give the reason why I think it was sexual of a sexual nature later on. Let's see if I have any questions I need to take on that. Does that make sense to everyone? Um, it, it is the language of trauma. Associative. So I want to make, make sure that, that that's understood why I'm doing that. So we have the, the self-reference of child, and then we have that dissociative, passive-type language. Now, I'm not saying that George did it. She's telling the truth about George. But her language is giving an indication, and it has in the past too, of severe abuse. She broke down in tears and admitted to dark fears her pedophile dad abused Kaylee too. I know what he did to me, and that was my fear. I had one job to keep her safe. Now, this is from someone, you know, I meant to catch this earlier. This is from someone who internet searches showed was looking up chloroform. Remember the internet search on chloroform? And this is where it becomes complicated. It's, it's much easier to say she's a liar and put her away. Or she's telling the truth, I believe, or you know, that, that sort of thing. Human nature is much more complex. Much more complex. 
interesting that she's chosen this wording knowing full well that she may have knocked out gaily or at least thought of it and enough to the point of researching it. Um, Topsy, a, a great question. Could she have killed her to almost try to save her, you know, in their warped perception? Yeah. I think, um, and that's, we've seen people under mental duress do something like that. Uh, they don't perceive reality as others do. It doesn't necessarily indicate that dad was the abuser. So I'm going to get to that. Um, I have some opinions on that, but I'm going to reduce it to opinions rather than just the analysis. She's targeting her dad, but she's done, she's fabricated enough reality that I can't say with certainty she's telling the truth about her dad. The word she's chosen tells us that something did happen to her, though. And, and there's, there's more. I know what he did to me, and that was my fear. I had one job to keep her safe. So this will sound terribly disingenuous. Your job was to go out and party. Your job was to go out and have indiscriminate sex. Your job was to avoid working. But that's what your job was. At least that's what you showed us your job was. So this, I think, is a projection of guilt. Uh, I also wonder whether or not, and this, this happens sometimes, is Kaylee may have been targeted uh, predominantly out of inconvenience, but as, a, as an added bonus in her perception as a way of getting to her mother. You didn't protect me. And I think that, that was part of Cindy's guilt. I failed her again and again and again because I protected the person who hurt me. So this is another signal of a manipulator. She is giving the reason why for three years she did not protect her daughter. And protection of a daughter is instinctive. It's something that we have uh, and when it's absent in an adult, it's terribly alarming. So she has the need to explain why she failed again and again and again. Now, I thought it was just once, and I thought you didn't know about the other times. I did protect my abuser, and that crushes me. So now she's moving from maybe he got to Kaylee. She's taking ownership, which I can't fault here because the, the amount of time that has passed over the years. Um, some abuse of men in, the, in these type of cases have such terrible regret of what they did early in life that they uh, become quite close to and protective of grandchildren. Others will go on to molest their own grandchildren. And her dad was never allowed to be alone with her daughter, she said. So this is something that would have come out more so in the trial. And then to me, this is so fascinating. But the last time she saw Kaylee alive was resting next to her in bed on June 16th, 2008, when it's possible the door was unlocked to her room. So she's gonna tell us this mother with all this regret and the failure to protect, she's gonna tell us at the last time she saw Kaylee alive. If you were sleeping with your toddler next to you, just put yourself right into her shoes. Would you begin with, it's possible the door was unlocked? Does that mean you normally lock the door? I know my dad was at home. I was awoken by him shaking me 
and asking me where Kaylee was. And I think there may be some truth in this, just that not in the time frame that she's talking about. Remember she avoided for 30 days and they assumed that she was busy or whatever. And then they started to get nervous. She insisted it didn't make sense because her daughter would never leave without telling her. So that means a three-year-old would say, hey, I'm going off with Papa now. So the, I think most people are going to have trouble believing that anyway. After a frenzied search, she went outside and saw Dad standing there with her. So Dad came in and shook her, saying, where's Kaylee? And they're searching everywhere. And then Dad is standing there with her. She was soaking wet. I can see him standing in his hands, there in his hands, telling me it's my fault that I did that, that I caused that. Caused what? Her being wet is all I, the information I have. What shape is your daughter in? And you see that goes into the present tense language. Uh, this is beyond the scope of what I'm doing here, but the present tense language here can be trauma, perseverating about trauma from way back, not about, uh, not about Kaylee definitively. And I think this may be the language of trauma as well. But he didn't rush to call 911 and he wasn't trying to resuscitate her. Oh, so now we know something about her state. We didn't know that before. We have to assume it, that she wasn't breathing or she was unconscious, but you don't tell us that. What you're doing is you're blaming him again. And I just collapsed with her in my arms. She was in your arms. And she was heavy and cold. As I'm sitting there with her on my lap, just hysterical. She's comparing hysterics with something else. She's not telling the truth. Just staring at her, not knowing what to do. He took her from me. He takes her back to the present tense language from me and he immediately softens his tone and tells me it's going to be okay, that she's going to be okay. And I, I think this is a possibility of something terribly creepy from her childhood, but it's not about Kaylee. That's when he said to me, I wanted to believe him because I wanted her to be okay. She still doesn't know why her daughter was wet. You have a pool, and you live in Florida, but she doesn't know. But said the light of the pool was not there at the time. There are too many scenarios what could have happened, but her drowning in the pool is not one. It's not possible. Couldn't George have thrown her in the pool uh, since he's the one being blamed? Couldn't he have drowned her? Her dad then took Kaylee, and I don't know why this is broken up, she said, crying as she, claim, as she claimed, but I don't know where she went. I don't know what he did. You recognize that she was found down the block from your house, less than a half mile away, with some of your childhood mementos. I can tell you about how numb I felt, but she's gonna, this is about her again and how broken I felt and confused, but also hopeful because I believe that she was still okay. And so having now given a reason of why she would have hope, it's okay to go out and party. It's okay to go out dancing. Anthony claimed she was too numb to confront what may have happened while maintaining that she genuinely, it's, it's difficult to picture. I, I'm, I'm not likely to see the documentary, but it would be interesting to know what kind of questions and what, what, what was left unchallenged in this. Maintain that she genuinely believed Kaylee was alive right up to it and, until her skeletal remains were found in trash bags with duct tape wrapped around her head in a woodland near the home six months later. 
yes, I was naive. Yes, I was dumb. I thought there was still a chance. No, not according to your first initial statement, in which we would indicate that death existed. So she's continuing to manipulate. She's continuing to lie. Her lies and manipulation speak to us if we're listening. Casey's version of events in the documentary differs from what she told police after her mother called 911. Casey was arrested the next day on charges of child neglect, giving false statements and obstruction. At the opening of her 2011 trial for murder, Casey's lawyer admitted the babysitter never existed. So that was that, remember she hung on to that one for the longest time and the grandmother, um, those of you would recognize the deceptive nature of Cindy's language, blaming someone named Zenaida. Claimed Kaylee had drowned in the family pool. Casey also blamed, and this is where it all may have come from. It may have come from our attorney. Casey also blamed her dad for her instinct to lie about what happened to Kaylee, calling him a man incapable of ever telling the truth, whose behavior she completely replicated. So even here, where she says that she failed, she failed, she failed to protect, her one job that she had to was to protect, even here, she's not taking responsibility for her own lying. Anthony had grown up lying more than I ever told the truth because the truth was too painful and too unreal to ever describe to someone. And so this is why she made up her job, this and that. You see a little bit of uh, insight even into the family with her brother, Lee. Does anyone recall Lee posting an ad for a personal assistant who had to be available 24 hours a day, seven days a week without pay? A little bit insight into the family with that. That included lying to the cops when her daughter was missing. She rarely admitted of the sole charges she was convicted of, leading to three years in prison. It was the right guilty verdict. I did lie to law enforcement. So I am a convicted liar. <laughs> it's the truth. She said she waited so long to tell her story because she spent the last 10 years making sure I knew who I was, that I had started to cope with this loss. That's not something that a mother of a murdered child would say. No guilt. Coping with my father killed my, my daughter. So she avoids that, that type of direct language, at least what we have here. And this is part of that, sitting for the, the documentary series. So it's about her again. But I know what I'm afraid of. I know what eats at me at night. I know what eats at me day after day because I know what I live through. So she's not committing there into anything in particular. I didn't get the ending I wanted because I didn't get my kid back. Interesting choice of word there. She said the shittiest bad dream, I guess, of having the shortest life with her sweet little kid. That's the only ending I wanted. That's the one thing I will never get out of all this. Which of course, some of you are already asking, well, what are the things you're getting out of this? So I would not be surprised to see a big paycheck or and or a book deal, that sort of thing. Let me get back to the questions you may have now. So um there are indicators even in this language that Casey was abused in childhood. Generally speaking, broad brushing here. The victims of early childhood sexual abuse uh, are generally or almost always impacted for life. Some will become cold and indifferent to the suffering of others, which is where I think Casey falls. Others will become hypervigilant protectors, uh, sometimes even got going uh, further on down to uh, a level of suspicion that sometimes is even too much. 
but no one is unaffected. No one is, um, and no families are unmoved by such things. So she gives indication, even while she's fabricating, that she was indeed a victim of abuse, and I think it was sexual abuse. Here's one of the reasons why I, I, I think that is, not, and not just in the language, but this is an opinion. The type of callousness that she displayed, the coolness under fire, the ability to deceive police who represent authority, the ability to blame others, the ability to kill her daughter and then drive around with a dead body in the car while she went out partying isn't a normal pattern of selfishness. My belief, my opinion, someone of this base character, someone with the ability, even at a young age, to, to deny the natural instinct in dealing with a toddler, this extreme behavior on her part and her fabrication of reality, there had to be, in my opinion, early trauma that created this. It isn't just a normal pattern of someone influenced by television or social media or uh, bad relationships with people around her. It's something that comes from childhood. There is a callousness about her, except for herself. And I don't think she cares who she destroys. Now, having said that, I don't know if it was George, if it was Lee, if it was George and Lee, if it was an uncle, if it was someone else. I don't know. And it's very difficult when you listen to her because she'll fabricate on anyone. I think that she was using sexual favors with her attorney based upon his own words. And I think she's been about herself and manipulating others. I am not qualified to diagnose someone, so I can't call her a sociopath. She's sociopathic. She's sociopath-like. That has to come from somewhere. So that is why I believe that she was a, a victim of acute early childhood sexual abuse by someone. It'd be very difficult to discern uh, by whom because of, you know, you need to know more about the family and the dynamics and uh, it would be very difficult to discern from her own language. But she is the language of someone who in my conclusive estimation with statement beyond this, who suffered trauma and is callous towards the suffering of others to an extreme point where a toddler was in the way of what? Of partying. I think she was probably drugging her child and uh, Xanax would show up in the system And perhaps that's the reason why she was looking at chloroform to see how, how that would work out. She murdered her child. I think she's, she's starting to try to cash in again. And um, oh, Milan, great point. Her promiscuous behavior also can be a sign of early uh, sexual abuse. And that, I believe that. I don't think it was just the normal um, cultural impact. I know that can be part of it. I can't dismiss all the other points around this with that. Um, the handwriting analysis. So I, I always have to make this apology every time I do this. Um, when I first started studying handwriting analysis, 
uh, I dismissed it because what I I found some um, a lack of self discipline for the for the short explanation. Uh, Steve Johnson and some others do terrific work in the handwriting. They're very disciplined. So I've I've come around to that much more. I I don't think there's anything, including the body language. Um, you uh, most people enjoy the behavioral panel. They they do great work. I love the debate that goes on. I, you know, I appreciate the program. I think it's an important part of discernment. It's something we all use. I think that um, body language, behavioral analysis, handwriting analysis, all these things combined with the words that someone chooses. I think in looking at our world and how we've been created, we're the only species that communicates like this through speech and through writing. So I think it's the most important discerning tool that we have, but that's not to, to dismiss the other tools. I think they're they're great. Uh, when I talk about body language analysis, we all use it. We use it correctly or incorrectly or trained or untrained, but we all use it and we all have opinions like that. But I think there's nothing that is more reliable than the language, even for someone like Casey Anthony, who's revealing herself in these statements, in the early police statement and then now. And she's re revealing herself to be someone that is utterly or exhaustively about self. And a level of callousness towards a child that is, um, it's not due to drugs. It's not due to a drunken stupor. Where there's a, a an altered state for a, a short period of time or someone worn down by lots of substance abuse. It's who she is. And I expect nothing else from the from the documentary other than that visibility. Yep, and um, her story keeps changing and it, and it probably will change even as um, she said it so many times. So when someone goes back into memory of what they previously said, which one do I choose? I didn't keep track of it when it first started, so now I have different stories. Sexual abuse, uh, Tanya, runs in families. And it, it does, and the impact goes on and on, and everyone that loves the victim can suffer. No, it, um, if you heard me earlier, I was saying that the um, many people who are terribly abused become very protective, very loving. Uh, very good parents. But there are some like this, that, and I think they're, they're rare, who become monsters. The insight from the fabrication of reality is, is very powerful. Um, do I have any comment on Rich Planet being handed by the press? Uh, I did one analysis of the bombing just one vic alleged victim, right? One uh, alleged victim's statement, uh, a young girl, and she was telling the truth. She was speaking from experiential memory. Inter really interesting statement too, because in her statement, she blames her father for being late, but saw him as a hero at the same time. And she's making a statement about the, the bombing and how scared she was. And she even talked about the, the intrusiveness of shrapnel. She was, it was experiential memory. She was telling the truth. What was really interesting to me about that is uh, most fathers of young teens or preteen uh, pre or somewhere around that age understand that dichotomy because they're close to their daughters. They understand that uh, a teenager can have both anger and resentment and adoration all at the same time towards the father. 
So she was telling the truth about what took place. And I think all human beings are born with the same uh, nature. That this is why we, we discipline our children. It's because this is what happens when you don't discipline a child and teach a child that lying is wrong. That fallen nature, I think, isn't part of all of us. And uh, those who, who grasp that and who, who accept that, no matter how unpleasant it may be, are the ones that do best in the criminal analysis world. Those that I think that, that fight against what human nature really is struggle, struggle in the criminal analysis. Any other questions on the analysis or, or the case itself? Quite a bit has come back to memory as I'm working through this. It was like watching a circus go by. For those of you that used to watch this on the Nancy Gray show, and you know, there was the, the entire theatrics and the, I think the nation, at least the United States was watching. Um, she did get a lot of information out of there. And I appreciate that effort. I simply don't think that the normal pattern in life is one that Casey followed in terms of suddenly turning into, uh, at age 20 or something, an evil baby killer. I think that the, um, the damage that is done is, is more than I could quantify or qualify when children are assaulted. So, and, and that also is a, a belief of mine that we're image bearers of our creator and that violence done to the judicially innocent, the child that hasn't done anything to deserve these things uh, can take a terrible toll in life, including on the immune system. Yeah, and Millie um, wrote, always wondered why she didn't pursue charges against her father. Now, a lot of abusers don't, uh, abuse victims don't, but in this particular case, I agree with you because this is about a murder of her daughter and we'd expect her to have the protective capacities that weren't there. And they're artificially being said now all these years later. So I think that was a good point. Yep. And what I was hoping to, and I'm not sure if it, if it was went through it, is that you would see that even where she could be fabricating reality, she's still revealing herself. In that sense, everything is autobiographical. And it just, it, it takes some, some practice and, and it, it can go very well in the training, but it, it takes some struggles. Um, do I go live often? I'm hoping to, to do a little more video work. I'm, I'm going to have to learn how to use the software and get a good camera and that sort of thing. Um, but I do like it. I like the interaction. I like to answer the questions. Uh, what stood out most here? It, it, are you referring to the new statements or the original one? Interesting awakening art. I like that comment. A certain satisfaction having put it over someone else. On well, the original statement, what stood out most to me was the hypersensitivity that is to a point where 
um, trained animals will say that baby was harmed. And I don't want to go too much into it now because it's for um, difficult to explain, but I don't think that uh, Kay Lee's death was accidental. I don't think it was gentle. We look at some hypersensitivity and um, there's powerful emotion there. And for her, it's more than just withholding information. I think Kaylee died a, a terrible death. I don't think she was drugged to sleep. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, I hope this was helpful. And uh, hopefully we'll have some work coming up, especially in the, in the new year with different cases. If you have any cases and you want to email me or you can leave it on the Facebook page. Uh, also, I'm on Twitter and I put the, some announcements out there. I haven't done as much in the blog. It becomes a little bit difficult with some of the, the censorship that's still going on. Um, I handle some pretty sensitive cases at times, that, public cases, and that becomes a little bit difficult. So thanks, everyone.